Tigers TV. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the OHL Priority Selection Lottery. Those of you joining us on Rogers TV, some of you joining us on YouTube, we are thrilled that you joined us this evening. My name is Sean Fafaro. I'm the host of Hefner Kitchener Rangers Hockey on Rogers TV. But tonight, we will be talking Kitchener Rangers and Guelph Storm as they prepare for finding out where they will, uh, where they will draft in this year's lottery. I am joined by two head coaches and two general managers, but really only two guys, separated by 26 kilometers of Highway 7. George Burnett, the head coach and GM of the Guelph Storm, and Mike McKenzie, head coach and GM of the Kitchener Rangers. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us on a very, very exciting evening. Thanks, Sean. Uh, first of all, I'll ask you briefly, when you first heard, and Mike, I'll start with you on this one. When you first heard uh, that the lottery was about to happen, uh, what were your thoughts? How, uh, what did you think hearing the OHL was doing a draft lottery for the first time? Well, I think the first thing was definitely excitement. It's something that's never been done before, and it's obviously been a, a very unique year with no games being played. So uh, the league you know, deemed it the only fair way to do it, and uh, I think it was a, a good decision. It adds a little bit of excitement for, for all the teams and their fan bases. So I think everyone's looking forward to see how it plays out here. And George, what about you? Uh, when you first heard about the lottery, what did you think? Well, it is unique, as Mike says, uh, but really the, the the fairest way to per, to move forward, uh, to get back, and and we are optimistic about the future, but the only fair way to go, and for everybody to have an opportunity tonight, uh, uh, it's caused a great, uh, tremendous buzz in the hockey community, and a lot of kids have been waiting for uh, for a long time for uh, for some progress, and we're we're there now. So uh, we're going to have the league. Uh, we'll join the, the live stream for the league momentarily uh, in just a few minutes as they get set up there. Uh, we will have the draft lottery revealed 1 through 19 in the first round. There will be 19 numbers drawn in the first round. Niagara does not have uh, a first round pick. But guys, after the last 15 months, this has to seem like the first step really in a return to normalcy for the OHL. So I know you both said you're excited, but for a GM and a head coach, this has to feel like Christmas Eve, doesn't it, George? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we've missed the kids, we've missed the games, the practices, uh, you know, the routine, and uh, to have a chance to get back to preparing for a draft. Uh, we've we've evaluated in so many different ways this year. Uh, we've watched skill sessions, we've watched practices, two, three on three, five on five. Some some competitive, very little. Uh, the, the gathering of the information. Uh, uh, is 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 very important right now. Those Zoom calls, those uh, those interactions with families are are critically important. Yeah, and I agree exactly with what George just said. And it's an exciting time, I think, for all 20 teams. Um, you know, you've you've done a lot of the work now, and uh, the draft's exciting every year. But to have the lottery and um, have something really positive and exciting for the league, I think, is uh, is great. Um, and I think everyone's looking forward to not only tonight but also the actual draft. And um, it's going to be a great event. So one more question for you guys, and and I have to ask because my understanding is that the draft will be a serpentine pattern, right? It'll go down and then go up. So What's your what's your preference? Do you do you want that pick near the top? Do you want one, two, three, meaning you'll be picking near the end of that second round, or do you want something around the middle? Do you want something where you're picking in the middle of each? You know, what's what's the preference, Mike? I think it depends what team you are and where your picks are. And personally, for us, we don't have a second round pick, so um, the snake draft is a little bit um, different for us and many other teams that don't own their actual second round pick. So I think you'll see a lot of teams. 
uh, smiling when you, they see certain teams pop up early or late, depending on um, whose second or third round pick they own. Um, so it'll definitely be unique in that sense. And all the picks have been traded to different teams, I think, except for five of them in the second round. So it's not going to be an actual real true representation of um, the order it goes in the second round. So I think it's just another thing to consider and another thing to uh, get some excitement for, for tonight's announcements. Uh, absolutely, Mike. I, I agree with your your comments. Uh, in our case, we don't have our second. We have Mississaugas, and uh, in the third round, we have Barry's pick. So, um, yes, I'd love to pick first and and uh, be high in the first round. But depending on how things shake down, we know that we don't have our picks in the second or third. So it should uh, create some some very big uh, interest around uh, around our picks. All right, gentlemen, lots more to talk about after the numbers are revealed. Uh, I will let you each go off to your respective home war rooms and watch the priority selection as it happens live. Uh, Mike and George will join me again after the revelation of all 19 first round picks. We will see you back here in 20 or 25 minutes, but let's throw it to the league with the OHL programs. priority. And as well, use sport for players that utilize their OHL scholarship. At this time, I would like to Turn it over for the review of the lottery process and procedures to everyone. Good luck. Stay safe. The OHL Priority Selection Draft Lottery will determine the order of selection for the 2021 OHL Priority Selection presented by Real Canadian Superstore. This year's event will largely see the top players born in 2005 within OHL jurisdiction eligible to be selected. Each OHL team participating in the first round has an equal chance of securing the first overall pick through the lottery process. The order of selection is determined by a computerized random number generator lottery process with results overseen and certified by Mr. Robert Bain, partner with the law firm Fillion Wakeley, Thorup Angeletti. For the first time since being implemented online in 2001, the OHL priority selection will be held over the course of two days, with the first three rounds starting at 7 p.m. on Friday, June 4th. Rounds 4 through 15 will take place on Saturday, June 5th, starting at 9 a.m. The priority selection remains its customary 15 rounds in length. Unlike in past years, this year's event will see OHL clubs select in a serpentine arrangement, with the order of selection in the first round being reversed to begin round two, and alternating each round thereafter. All 15 rounds of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection presented by Real Canadian Superstore can be seen live on the OHL's YouTube channel with additional coverage on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and on the web at OntarioHockeyLeague.com. OHL Vice President Ted Baker will take us through tonight's proceedings. Thank you, Josh. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 OHL Priority Selection Lottery Announcement. A special welcome to all prospective players, parents, sponsors, our tremendous fans, and of course all of our member teams who are watching tonight through our YouTube channel. All precautions were undertaken to ensure that the lottery was conducted and announced in a safe environment according to government regulations. The lottery was scrutinized by Mr. Rob Bain, partner with the law firm of Fillion, Wakeley, Thorup and Angeletti, and Mr. Bain has approved and authorized the results. The results of the lottery will be announced in inverse order of the 19 teams participating in the first round, commencing with the 19th overall selection through to the third and then the first overall selection followed by the second. The lottery process saw the random generation of numbers through a computer program. The order of selection for all subsequent rounds will be in serpentine fashion with the results of round one being reversed, commencing with round two. Now let's get the announcement underway. The 19th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Barry Colts. Turning their sights to the future with the additions of Evan Veerling, Ethan Cardwell and Connor Punnett in the latter half of the 2020 season, the Barry Colts are primed for big things in the year ahead. Homegrown talent Tyson Forster is considered one of the league's top goal scorers. Brant Clark's in the conversation as the top eligible defenseman for the 2021 NHL Draft. And 2029th overall pick Hunter Haight is waiting in the wings for his chance to shine. 
The player chosen 19th overall will have the opportunity to step in and be a part of things with a franchise built on the shoulders of a giant and former head coach Dale Howarchuk, whose legacy lives on in Barry. The 18th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Sioux Greyhounds. The Sioux Greyhounds have historically used the 18th overall pick to build on the back end, doing so as recently as 2019 with the selection of Jacob Holmes from the York Simcoe Express. The Hounds have chosen defensemen in two of the past three priority selections, bringing in current captain and Minnesota Wild prospect Ryan O'Rourke 20th overall in 2018. They're eager to get a glimpse of 2020 fourth choice Bryce McConnell Barker in red and white next season. Having won back-to-back -back West Division titles in 2017 and 18, paired with a Western Conference crown three years ago, the Greyhounds, who have produced such names as Jared McCann, Darnell Nurse, Morgan Frost, and Barrett Hayton in recent years, are on the ascent, looking to contend in the year ahead. The 17th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Kitchener Rangers. The 17th pick is familiar territory for the Kitchener Rangers, who feature two players on their current roster acquired with the selection. The Blue Shirts tabbed the first half of a twin combination, 17th in 2020, picking up Andrew LeBlanc of the Southern Tier Admirals before following up with brother Jacob in the third round. Toronto Marlboros alumnus Reed Vallad was taken 17th in 2018. Playing out of one of the OHL's finest facilities at the Odd, the Rangers excelled under Mike McKenzie during the 2019-20 season, winning 40 games. Like most OHL clubs, the Rangers will be adjusting to life after household names like Riley Damiani and Jacob Ingham, but the player selected 17th on June 4th will join a well-rounded group featuring a force down the middle in Francesco Pinelli, along with hard-hitting Detroit Red Wings prospect Donovan Sobrango on the blue line. The 16th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the London Knights. The London Knights have looked to the Ottawa region for each of their past two first rounders, bringing in Canada Lasers forward Ben Bajold last year after drawing big power winger Stuart Roloffs from the same program in 2019. The green and gold are on a run of five consecutive forwards picked in the first round since former OHL Defenseman of the Year Evan Bouchard was their top pick in 2015. With three OHL championships and a Memorial Cup in the past decade, Knights General Manager Mark Hunter and his staff have a proven track record of building winners. They'll have the chance to continue doing so on June 4th when the Knights pick 16th overall for the first time in franchise history. The 2021 OHL Priority Selection Draft Lottery will continue after these messages. Real Canadian Superstore and the CHL want you to enter the Design a Jersey Contest. Come up with your very own design and you may see your jersey during a CHL game next season. Leave your mark, get your creative juices flowing and enter now. The 15th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Saginaw Spirit. If recent history tells a story, the Saginaw Spirit shoot for the stars on draft day. General Manager Dave Drinkle and his team called the name of coveted late 2004 born forward Adam Fantilli 18th overall a year ago, made record setting high scoring winger Cole Perfetti the 5th overall pick in 2018 and looked in their own backyard with the selections of current New York Islanders prospects Blade Jenkins and Bodie Wild with their first two picks in 2016. Back-to-back -back West Division champions, the Spirit made their first ever appearance in the Western Conference Championship Series in 2019. Chris Lazary's club will have a whole new look when the puck drops next season, but they'll still bring their signature no-quit style to the Dow Event Center, featuring a new face taken with the 15th selection. The 14th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to 
the Hamilton Bulldogs. Three years removed from an OHL championship in 2018, the Hamilton Bulldogs will miss the goal-scoring greatness of Arthur Kaliev, but have some drafted and developed talent coming of age in forwards Logan Morrison, Avery Hayes, Ryan Winterton, and Lawson Shirk. The Dogs used their opening pick on a defenseman for the first time last year with the addition of Jorian Donovan from the Canada Lasers. This year, Steve Steos and company come to the draft table with the 14th overall pick, looking to further a culture of development in Steeltown that's produced the likes of Matthew Strom, Marion Studenich, and Mackenzie Entwistle, just to name a few. The 13th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Sarnia Sting. Sarnia Sting fans have been treated to some tremendous talent over the years, from Steven Stankos to Jacob Chikrin, and more recent stars like Red Tilson Trophy winner Jordan Kyrou, Carolina Hurricanes draftee Jamison Reese, and 2020 Anaheim Ducks first rounder Jacob Perot. General Manager Dylan Sika will make his first ever selection with a 13th overall pick for a Sting franchise that has frequented forwards in the first round. The only exceptions in the past 15 years have been 2019 7th choice Ben Goodrow between the pipes and Chikrin manning the blue line in 2014. Sarnia's pick on June 4th will be added to a depth chart that includes last year's third overall pick, offensively gifted forward Max Nemestikov. The 12th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Ottawa 67s. Andre Tourigny's Ottawa 67s have been the team to beat the past few years, winning back-to-back -back Hamilton Spectator trophies with consecutive first-place finishes. Reigning OHL Player of the Year Marco Rossi, the league's top defenseman Noel Hoffenmeyer, and six-foot-six shutdown blue liner Kevin Ball have moved on, making way for the next generation of young talent brought in by 2020 Jim Gregory OHL GM of the Year Award winner James Boyd and his staff. Picking 12th overall, the same spot Brian Kilray selected franchise cornerstone Logan Couture back in 2005, the 67s will target a building block for a bright future in the nation's capital. The 11th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the North Bay Battalion. After a changing of the guard early in the 2019-20 season, the North Bay Battalion enter a new era eager to enlist some of their newest recruits at the Gardens. Starting with last year's first overall choice Ty Nelson on the blue line, Battalion GM Adam Dennis and his scouting staff brought in Quinty Red Devils forward Dallin Wakeley in the second round and a sure-handed left-shot defender in Tanias Mathurin in the third. Now the guys in green will add more youth to a veteran core that includes 6'6 netminder Joe Verbedek and puck-moving blue liner Avery Winslow with the 11th pick on June 4th, a spot the troops have yet to possess in the 23-year history of the franchise. We'll be back with more selections after these messages. Some people call it spring. We call it Kubota season. With a complete range of tough, durable equipment and attachments, it's time to get to work. Hey man, everything all right? Don't worry about it. Hey, you know it's cool to talk about these things. We all have bad days. Talk Today program has reached over 1,000 OHL players, encouraging them to talk about their mental health. We take mental health seriously. You should too. The 10th selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Erie Otters. The Erie Otters have taken advantage of the OHL Priority Selection in the past decade, putting the pieces in place to string together a CHL record four consecutive 50-win seasons capped with an OHL championship in 2017. Though it's not a top two pick like they used to bring in franchise cornerstones Connor McDavid and Dylan Strom, the 10th overall slot is one the Otters have made the most of in past years, acquiring a pair of power wingers turned NHL draft picks in David Broll and Anthony Peluso, as well as an eventual career all-time games played leader in defenseman Brian Lee back in the year 2000. Former third overall pick Connor Lockhart is stepping into the spotlight next season as VP and general manager Dave Brown and his staff continue putting in the work to keep the Otters competitive in the always challenging Midwest Division. The ninth selection 
in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Mississauga Steelheads. The Mississauga Steelheads come to the draft table picking inside the top 10 for the seventh time in the past nine years. They've got a trio of 2020 top 40 selections up front in Zachary Lavoie, Owen Beck, and Carson Christie. They'll be looking to work into the lineup next season, and the player chosen ninth on June 4th will join a GM and head coach in James Richmond, who's developed NHL draft picks in brothers Michael and Ryan McLeod, big defenseman Nicholas Hag, and Florida Panthers winger Owen Tippett in recent years. The Trout won a 2017 Eastern Conference title behind the force of those aforementioned names. They've fired up their development cycle, building through the OHL priority selection once again towards a competitive future. The eighth selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL priority selection belongs to the Owen Sound Attack. The Owen Sound Attack are no strangers to picking eighth, now preparing to do so for the eighth time in franchise history. The Bears grabbed an all-time great in former OHL champion and present-day assistant coach Joey Hishon in the eighth spot back in 2007. Joined by the London Knights as one of just two Canadian Hockey League teams on a run of 10 straight seasons of 30 wins or more, the attack haven't picked inside the top 10 since selecting Marcus Phillips as a compensatory pick in 2015. It's the OHL's smallest community, but one that has produced names like Bobby Ryan, Jordan Bennington, and Nick Suzuki. The fans come out in full force, too, as the Owen Sound faithful regularly pack the Bayshore in support of their attack. The seventh selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Flint Firebirds. The Flint Firebirds were a Western Conference contender in 2020, setting records with 40 wins and 82 points in their fifth OHL season. Though they'll adjust to life after captain and leader Ty Delandria, the Birds have a lot to be excited about in top 2021 NHL draft prospect Brennan Othman, speedy former second round pick Braden Kressler, and big six foot three winger Riley Piercy. Flint will pick seventh for the first time. The same slot original Firebird and eventual OHL champion Will Bitten was taken by the Plymouth Whalers prior to relocation in 2014. With state-of-the-art player amenities and big-time upgrades going into the Dort Financial Center, Flint's a good place to land for a young player kicking off their OHL career. The sixth selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Peterborough Peets. The last Peterborough Pete to be taken sixth overall in the OHL Priority Selection made an instant impact. Matt Pumple scored 33 goals and was named both OHL and CHL Rookie of the Year in 2010. Opportunity knocks for the young player taken sixth on June 4th as the Pete say farewell to a number of talented graduates moving on to the next level including Akil Thomas, Nick Robertson and Semyon Durogachintsev up front, longtime fixture Declan Chisholm on the blue line and steady starting netminder Hunter Jones between the pipes. Head coach Rob Wilson had the Peets playing good hockey in his first two seasons at the helm. Now he'll lean on 2019 fifth overall pick Mason McTavish to lead the way into the future. The sixth overall pick come to Peterborough. Exciting news for all the fans tuned into the Peets live draft lottery watch party powered by fully promoted Peterborough. The 2021 OHL Priority Selection Draft Lottery will continue on the other side of the break. Making every cent count with the CIBC Dividend Visa Infinite Card. With a 10% cashback welcome bonus on gas and groceries, you'll put more money back in your pocket with the CIBC Dividend Visa Infinite Card. CIBC. Ambitions made real. My name is Kyle Pereira and I'm the Director of Player Recruitment at the Ontario Hockey League. At the OHL, we're thrilled about the upcoming priority selection and look forward to welcoming a new group of young men to the league. For more information on what it means to be an Ontario Hockey League player, please visit www.ontariohockeyleague.com and visit our prospect info page. There you will find all of our OHL Players First video segments, along with comprehensive information on the OHL's development, education, scholarship and player environment benefits. The fifth selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Kingston Frontenacs. The team featuring arguably the most exciting player in the Canadian Hockey League will get a shot in the arm on June 4th, selecting fifth in the OHL Priority Selection for the second year in a row. 
The Kingston Frontenacs pick up Toronto Marlboros leader Paul Ludwinski to man the forward ranks in last year's draft and get another shot with the fifth pick, one they used back in 2013 to select power winger Lawson Kraus. Paul McFarlane coached the Frontenacs to their first East Division title in 21 years back in 2016 and returns to the Limestone City after three years between the NHL's Florida Panthers and Toronto Maple Leafs. McFarland has added GM duties this time around as he and his staff try and make the most of a big opportunity next month. The fourth selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Windsor Spitfires. The Windsor Spitfires are a testament to what an elite first round pick can bring to a program as seen in former second overall selections Taylor Hall and Gabriel Velarde who each hoisted the Memorial Cup in a Spitz uniform. Windsor picks fourth for the first time since 1996 as one of the OHL's greatest all-time playmakers looks to set his team up for long-term success. General Manager Bill Bowler already has two of the league's top 2002 born forwards on his depth chart in New York Rangers prospect Will Cooley and Colorado Avalanche draftee Jean-Luc Foudy. Don't forget 2021 NHL draft prospect Wyatt Johnson, who had a strong showing for Canada at the U18 Worlds. The Spits are hoping next season will be one they can make a splash in the postseason, and an impact fourth overall pick in the lineup certainly won't hurt their chances of doing just that. The third selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priory Selection belongs to the Guelph Storm. It's been humorously said that the Guelph Storm are the longest reigning champion the league has ever seen. But all kidding aside, a third overall pick for the first time in their history sets them up to be in the conversation once again in the not too distant future. Through the work of both coach and GM George Burnett, as well as his managerial predecessor Mike Kelly, the Storm have efficiently built champions in 2014 and 2019, doing so largely through the draft with core pieces in former captain Matt Finn, tenacious attacker Robbie Fabry, and big winger Isaac Ratcliffe, all chosen in the opening round. There will be a new look in Guelph next season, but based off the Storm's recent track record of development, it won't be long before they're a force once again. The first overall selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection belongs to the Sudbury Wolves. And that means that the Oshawa Generals have the second overall selection in the first round of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection. If his play in the pro ranks this year has been any indication, it looks like the LA Kings are pretty high on their 2020 second overall pick, Quentin Byfield. Whether big number 55 is ever back in a Wolves uniform or not, GM Rob Papineau and company will have another big name to welcome to the Nickel City as the Sudbury Wolves have officially drawn the first overall pick of the 2021 OHL Priority Selection presented by Real Canadian Superstore. The Wolves have picked first a total of six times in their history, with 2018 pick Byfield, 2015 selection David Levin, and 2008 edition John McFarland included on that list. The Wolves are coming off their first Central Division title in 19 years and will add the top pick in 2021 to a lineup that includes Tampa Bay Lightning prospect Jack Thompson on the blue line and 2021 NHL draft prospect Chase Stillman on the attack. Right down to the wire for the Oshawa Generals, who will pick second on June 4th, doing so for the first time since 2006 when they picked up a present-day 700-game NHL veteran in smooth-skating defenseman Michael Delzato. Jenny's fans have been treated to some great hockey in recent years, highlighted by Anthony Sorelli's Memorial Cup heroics in 2015 and a trip to the Eastern Conference Championship Series two years ago. Oshawa was all in for the 2020-21 season, but despite losing talented Nashville Predators first round pick Philip Tomasino to graduation, the Generals will still bring back considerable 2002 born talent in Edmonton Oilers prospect Titulio on the wing and power play quarterback Leighton Moore calling the shots from the blue line. NHL draft prospect Brett Harrison looks to build off an impressive rookie campaign and will have the chance to do so with an elite talent taken second overall in the lineup next season. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the lottery announcement. We very much appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. 
and the OHL looks forward to an exciting two days on June 4 and June 5, where we welcome in another wave of exciting new players into the Ontario Hockey League. Stay safe, everyone. Have a good night. The Sudbury Wolves are the big winners of the first ever OHL Priority Selection Draft Lottery with the Oshawa Generals and Guelph Storm rounding out the top three selections. Follow the OHL on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and on the web at OntarioHockeyLeague.com in the coming weeks as we survey some of the top 2005 born prospects for next month's Priority Selection. For the first time since moving online in 2001, this year's event will be held over the course of two days with rounds one through three getting underway at 7 p.m. on Friday, June 4th, followed by rounds 4 through 15 starting at 9 a.m. on Saturday, June 5th. You can see it all live right here on YouTube. The Sudbury Wolves come away with the number one pick in the OHL Priority Selection Lottery because why not add some extra talent to play with Quinton Byfield? I bet you didn't expect to see Justin Bieber while you were watching the show tonight. Yes, that was Justin Bieber with Joey Hishin in the Owen Sound segment. And the London Knights coming up with the 16th pick, 15 lower than they jokingly tweeted out earlier today uh, they'd be picking. All right, the Kitchen Rangers coming away with the 17th pick here and the Guelph Storm coming away with the number three pick. So Mark McKenzie, head coach and general manager of the Rangers, let's talk to you first because the drama ended early, only three picks into this priority selection lottery. But the 17th pick has been good to the Rangers. Andrew LeBlanc last year uh, was your selection. Reed Vallad in 2018 was also the 17th pick. Uh, how are you feeling about the 17th pick right now for the Rangers? Uh, yeah, we didn't have to wait too long, that's for sure. Um, probably didn't go the way uh, we were really hoping um, with our pick being so late and then Ottawa's pick being uh, in the middle since we own their third round pick. So probably not the exact result we were looking for, but um, like you said, we've, uh, we've picked some pretty good players at number 17 and um, we're accustomed to picking outside the top 10. I think it'll be the uh, seventh year in a row where we haven't had a pick inside the top 10. So um, I guess we're used to it by now and we'll just have to do our homework and be ready to go when we're, we're up at 17. When you look at some of the talent, Mike, that the Rangers have got uh, after the 17th, right? Nazem Kadri came as the 18th pick. Jeff Skinner came as the 20th pick. So you can still get uh, a diamond in the rough there down there at 17. And George, uh, the storm comes away with the number three pick. First and foremost, I'll ask uh, how stressful was that last few picks listening when you were so close to getting that uh, one-two final announcement? Well, I, I don't know that it was stressful. It was it was exciting for sure. I know our fans, uh, um, I think, are going to get a, a real strong player. We're going to get a real strong player at three. We'll get uh, the best player available to us and uh, really feel that we've uh, we've done uh, uh, our work and, and we'll continue to do so up till June 4th and and. Uh, it's uh, an exciting time to be coming into our program. It's interesting to watch that, the way it all went down. It was kind of like an odd game of reverse Russian roulette, hoping that you don't see that logo come up. But when I look at the number three pick, George, uh, the Storm have never picked third or fourth, actually. But when I see the kind of talent that they've picked just below that, I look at Todd Bertuzzi, fifth in 91. Drew Doughty came fifth in 05. Robbie Fabry was a sixth round pick. Isaac Ratcliffe was a 15th pick. So how much do you expect a potential third round pick to contribute to, to the storm right off the hop? Well, I would expect them to contribute right away. There's uh, there's some uh, outstanding young players. I think uh, this this year, unlike any other year that we've we've dealt with, uh, uh, any player that's selected, um, you know, there, there's there's so much that can change in the development pro path to, based on whether you're early or late. But there's some there's some top players, and we're going to have one here in Guelph. 
Uh, we're uh, we're pleased with that opportunity. As Mike mentioned, uh, how the second and third round shake out. Uh, uh, we're really early, middle, and light over the first three rounds. So uh, feel uh, feel good about it. And uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of jockeying for uh, for positions uh, as we get uh, closer to June 4th. So a general question for, for the both of you here, and Mike, I'll ask you first on this. Um, obviously, when you're drafting anybody at this point, any OHL draft that you're going into, part of the factor, part of the things you're factoring in is how well your first year players played in the previous year. Are they the kind of players that are, are ready for the next step in, in a second year in the OHL? Neither of you got to see any of your first year players on the ice last year, at least not in OHL game specific situation. So uh, how much more difficult is it this year to draft not knowing the development of those first year players from last year? I don't think it makes drafting too much more difficult, but it's definitely a, a big question mark and a bit of an unknown, um, not just for our 16 year olds, but also for, you know, guys that are 17 or 18. And each year in our league, uh, it seems like guys take pretty big jumps in development from year to year. Um, so it's going to be really interesting. Um, I think I counted the other day, we have like close to 10 first year players will be on our team next year. And I think that'll be, that'll be the same around the league as with all the 16 and 17 year olds being for sure first year guys uh, and some 18 year olds even being first year guys, which is kind of rare too. So um, it's going to be unique, but everyone's in the same boat. So we'll, uh, we'll see how it plays out come the fall. Uh, similar from our end, I know we were planning on having seven first year players in our lineup uh, this past season. And uh, I, I would I would guess that, uh, you know, conceivably uh, upwards of half of your roster, uh, not quite half, but close to it, uh, could be first year players. But uh, those kids, as you mentioned, Sean, that uh, um, we drafted late a year ago, um, we're, we're, we're really comfortable that a couple of them have had some great uh, uh, development time despite being uh, such a unique season. And uh, they make, may make some decisions very difficult at training camp. Uh, we're hopeful that camp is uh, as competitive as possible, but I think if we're f as fair as we possibly can get everybody, whether you're an 03 born, an 04, or an 05 now, uh, that's the only way we can go. So I want to ask a question uh, just about an overall draft strategy. I don't want to ask either of you, obviously, what, what you're looking for in terms of needs for the current edition of the Storm and Rangers, respectively, but and George, I know you mentioned that picking at number three, you're going to get the best player available, obviously. Overall, from a draft strategy, wherever you're pack, uh, picking, in whatever round you're picking, what are you looking for? Are you looking for what the team needs? Are you looking for talent? Are you looking for skill? Are you looking for character? Are you looking for a combination of, of all of those things? Uh, yes, uh, the quick answer. Um, we'd like to have thinkers in our lineup as well, but skating and skills, uh, that uh, hockey sense, which you're talking about, character, compete, all those things are vitally important. And uh, uh, that's the challenge that your scouting staff and your management staff have in, in identifying these players. And uh, a lot of our information this year is going to come in some very unique ways. Uh, the uh, the interview process, uh, uh, the I mean, you can't sit in the same room. So those face-to-face -face interviews and and uh, and evaluating uh, young young players and their families, uh, understanding uh, what type of an opportunity you have in your program. Those are those are uh, very important things, but uh, it's probably you know no better time to just be a graphic and take advantage of the opportunity that you're creating for yourself and make it real tough for the coach and manager not to uh, give you an opportunity. Yeah, I think every team has a different uh, recipe, but all the things that both you and George mentioned are obviously important. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll pick the best player available to us at at 17, whoever that may be, and. We have a pretty specific criteria in terms of what we're looking for in players on and off the ice. Uh, and so we'll continue to follow that and uh, make sure that we're picking a guy that fits into that uh, mold, and a guy that uh, we feel would be uh, suited for the program um, that we have here in Kitchener. George, 29 seasons uh, the Guelph Storm have been drafting. Five times they've drafted someone named Matt. Are you looking at a Matt for this year perhaps to keep the streak going? <laughs> Well, I know there's some Matthews that are uh, that have that are they're certain they're in in the draft for sure, and uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll see how things shake out over the next few weeks here. And uh, excited to to get to June 4th, but a lot of work to be done uh, ahead of that time. 
All right, one final question for you guys, and then uh, and then I'll let you know. And George, I'll start with you on this one. Um, obviously, the draft of uh, night one of the draft, at least, is 30 days from today. So over the next 30 days, what does it look like with your scouting and coaching staff? Uh, how much work do you have to do to get ready for that? Well, I, I think now that we have an order, uh, I think it, it changes. Uh, I think uh, uh, again, picking early in the first round, you're you're probably eliminating a, a larger number of kids before you're going to pick again. Um, uh, you know, I think being, you know, those details, I think are the most important and, uh, getting, getting uh, some face time with, uh, with everybody. Uh, I know that, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to interview and, and if, if we haven't already done so speak to, uh, uh, upwards of a couple of hundred kids and, and making sure that, uh, uh, as, as Mike said, that they, they meet the requirements that we have and, and fit into our program and, and make the best selection possible on June 4th. Yeah, for us, it's nice to have some clarity um, on where we pick, and we won't be able to narrow it down quite as much as, um, you know, George and Guelph can, like he mentioned. Um, we'll have to have a lot more names available and um, and, and do our um, due diligence on a lot of different players because it's, uh, it's really hard to predict who will be available at pick 17. But um, next month, uh, lots of video scouting, um, you know, interviews, um, and then finally culminating in a in our last meeting uh, leading up to the draft where we can really nail down our, our final list and get a sense of where we stand and the guys that we like and might have a chance at. And uh, it'll be an exciting day on June 4th and 5th, that's for sure. Well, gentlemen, uh, I thank you so much for taking the time on our lottery special this evening. Uh, I will let you get, get started on your work because I know it starts right away. As you said, you've got 30 days until night one and uh, i truly mean this when i say this i cannot wait to see both of you at a hockey rink it's been 15 months since i've been in a hockey rink this has been fantastic but uh, thanks so much for joining us and uh, we'll see you hopefully on june 4th thanks, thanks sean, sean. criminalized. So we are taking away that, um, you know, almost that stigma that's associated around the word committed, um, you know, because committed implies that it's, you know, either immoral or that it's a, a, a committed an, an offense. Um, and so that language has really shifted. And so now we say someone has died by suicide. Um, you know, even language like a successful suicide, that would imply that, you know, if someone attempted suicide and did not die, then that was unsuccessful. And so we're very cautious about sort of this strength based um, people centered language. And that's why we have really shifted. I will include this caveat, though, um, because I often do that I would hope that that would also never shut down a conversation, though. So as difficult as, you know, the conversation about suicide in general is, um, I wouldn't want someone to not have a conversation because they were worried about language. You know, really, the importance of the awareness is the you know, the more we know, the better that we are able to do um, in terms of our conversations. And so I wouldn't want anyone to not have a conversation because they were worried about, um, you know, if I say committed, is that really wrong? Um, but we want to encourage people to really be thoughtful about that, to really intentionally shift 
um, and think about the impact of their language. Yes, and certainly that's a great point in that if you're starting to have the conversation, don't be afraid of making mistakes in what you're saying, right? But when you do and, and you are explained to why we are shifting to, to, to speak that way, most people completely understand and, and they, it, it is challenging if for so many years it's been uh, talked about one way to actually shift And that is quite common in all mental health and in terms of language there. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, support and bereavement, because unfortunately, some people do pass away by suicide and the family's left behind. And there's a a lot of guilt and there's a lot of worry um, to them. How do you support people through that when they're they're left behind? Yeah, when when certainly when someone is bereaved by suicide, there are a a lot of range of emotions. Um, You know, we have a suicide bereavement support group in our community. We offer four um, free suicide bereavement support groups, and currently they are virtual, um, as with most programming that's taking place. Um, But really for that group, it's about exploring sort of some of those questions. The group itself is actually called Why? Um, And it is an opportunity for people to come together in a a safe space uh, and really explore that grief journey that they're on. You know, with, with suicide bereavement, it's a traumatic bereavement experience. Um, And so it's led by two professional facilitators. Um, and they're really able to just support that. And, and it's been such a, um, a beneficial service to have in the community. Um, we quite often hear that those participants who have taken the group um, have really found it to be helpful to connect in with others who understand what that journey looks like. Um, we also have a World Suicide Prevention Day event every year um, that's hosted on September 10th. Um, It was virtual again this year, and we are hoping in the upcoming years we'll be able to return to the in-person, but there's uh, such healing that takes place when we can come together as a community, um, you know, and and again, talk very openly about the experiences that we have and support one another through this journey of, you know, not just healing, but hope and help. And I love the hope and help element of it because it doesn't always mean it, when we talk about it we can talk about it with hope because as more awareness is created and, and the services are there to support people there's a better chance at saving lives this way and in terms of the bereavement support how do people access that service what do they what do they do to get that help yeah the best way to connect in for the uh, bereavement support group is to actually connect right through our website so www.wrspc ca and there's an entire section around I've lost someone to suicide um, and they'll be able to find information about the support group um, right through the website. Excellent thank you so much for the information that you've provided today I really appreciate it and people can we will post all these links on our website as well so if you go to the rogerstv.com kickback page we'll have all these supports and services there that you can click on and get more information for. To register for the COVID-19 vaccine in Stratford and Perth County, visit hpph.ca or call 1-888-221-2133 and press 1. For season four of In the Gym, we have fantastic interviews with IFBB Hall of Famers, IFBB pros, exercise physiologists with PhD. We're going to be sharing fantastic information with you to get the best results in the gym. You wanted to make a difference. You wanted to save lives. They call you a hero, but the truth is, it's not easy. It's hard to be strong when you see things you can't unsee. You know you're not the only one, but no one may ever truly know how life has affected you. Maybe it's time to reach out. Name it, don't numb it. Get real about how you feel. Rogers TV is a proud community partner supporting Mental Health Week. For more information, go to mentalhealthweek.ca. 
In Canada, only one out of five children who need mental health services receives them. By age 40, about 50% of the population will have or have had a mental illness. In any given year, one out of five people in Canada, one in five, one in five people in Canada will personally experience a mental health problem or illness. Rogers TV is a proud community partner in supporting Mental Health Week. Get real about how you feel. Get real about how you feel. So thank you, Dr. Jackson, for being here at the Invisible Wounds Conference today. And your, your topic is all about, your keynote speech is all about creating that mental fitness plan. Mm -hmm. So when I think physical fitness, I, I think like the big muscles, I have to exercise, I have to eat well, I have to get rest. So what does that mean when you're talking about a mental fitness plan? What does that look like? Well, I think it's different for every individual, um, but similar to... Uh, a physical fitness plan, you're going to look at a variety of um, you know, muscle groups or skills or, or um, abilities. So when we're looking at a, developing a mental fitness plan, I want people to think about the way in which they think, the kinds of things they say to themselves. How do they, are they critical? Um, are they negative? Are they rigid in their self-talk? Um, you know, what are the things that kind of, uh, is in the back of their mind that they're constantly telling themselves about how, how to think or feel or mm -hmm. uh, about certain situations. So I'm wanting people just to become aware of uh, the self-talk, the things that go on in their daily life. Um, and then also begin to, to look at um, recognizing when some of that thinking becomes really negative and when that some of that thinking becomes very rigid. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we often tell people to do is to be very positive, uh, to think positively. And people often get stuck with that because if they have a negative thought, um, it's very difficult just to replace it with a positive thought. You know, if I look in the mirror and I say, you know, I'm really unattractive or I really don't like how I look, it, it's not going to work if I just replace it with a, a positive thought. Well, I'm very attractive. I need to be positive and build myself up. But we, we often need to teach people that they need to be realistic and kind of goal motivated in their self-talk so that it's not like ex two extremes kind of competing or going in a tug of war. Yeah. Um, so we really want to teach people to um, recognize their negative self-talk and then to begin to replace it with something that's a little bit more grounded in reality uh, about, you know, I'm not happy with how I look, but you know, I, I, I'm not I've really got some good points. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of softening the two extremes. And that seems to help um, open up opportunities for people to move and to find movement. And they're not trapped in one perspective. Mm -hmm. So cognitive, emotional, <laughs> that's a lot about what we'd look at. We would also look at how people um, develop uh, exercise would actually be a, a core part of building a mental fitness plan as well. Um, and also learning to relax, learning to kind of quiet the body uh, would be uh, important, you know, whether it's, it's through exercise or through meditating, um, through finding moments where we kind of uh, are able to reflect uh, and be with ourselves. And then the social component is beginning to think about what are the um, social supports you have in your life and also not just how many you have, but what's the quality of those social supports. Mm -hmm. And so wanting people, I mean, again, there's no right formula for everyone, but beginning to look at all these different areas uh, so that people can begin to think about what is it that I have to do um, to be mentally healthy, to develop skills in these certain areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think the link between, you know, the kind of building your physical fitness plan is, is the other point is that it's that's similar is that it requires effort. You know, we, uh, people might say, I want to be physically healthy, I want to have a good fitness plan, um, but then they go to the gym and they, you know, they, they go every day and they say, well, why aren't I getting physically fit? Well, are you sweating? Are you working? Do your muscles hurt at the end of the day? And no, well, that's what you need to do to make change, to have growth. And it's the same when we're talking about our mental health or emotional health. Uh, growth is about... Um, creating new habits, it's about challenging ourselves, it's about putting effort into things, and that's why I think sometimes it's, it's a nice kind of analogy to equate building your mental fitness plan mm -hmm. with similar to how you would build a physical fitness plan. And when should one start looking at building their mental fitness plan? 
as whenever they can. <laughs> um, and again, to kind of use a similar physical analogy, we don't wait till our teeth are falling out to go to the dentist. We learn very early in our life that going to the dentist and practicing good dental hygiene at home is part of preventative care and it's part of what creates healthy habits that really sustain us through our lives. And so again, it's beginning to talk with people when they are healthy and when they have a lot of mental energy to kind of solve problems, think about things, make change, to, to really begin to put healthy habits in their life, not just physically, but also mentally. Okay. And what are some challenges that someone might, might come up against when they're trying to impl implement something that's new, like this mental health fitness plan, like how, some challenges that they might come up against? Um, well, I think today we've come a long way uh, in improving people's attitudes uh, towards mental health, um, but I think there's still a lot of stigma out there. I think some of the changes that I'm seeing in my own private practice is that people are much better at um, caring about other people and allowing other people to uh, have difficulties, but there's still kind of this but not me <laughs> um, mentality. Uh, so I think there's still some stigma that we're, we're working with and struggling with um, to make it part of what people just do and think about on a regular basis. I think for first responders too, in, in particular, there's so much negativity uh, in their their daily lives and their jobs that it's really hard they want to just shut it off at the end of the day they they want to go home they don't really want to process a problem perhaps with their partner um, they might not want to deal with cranky kids they just kind of want to turn off the negativity and there's some value in being able to do that on occasion but if you get into a pattern of avoiding dealing with the things that you need to deal with you know whether it's you know having a few drinks with the guys after work or the girls after work or um, gambling or doing a lot of things uh, the bring us pleasure and help distract us from our pain, that we end up not putting the time and effort and motivation into doing the things that we need to do to stay mentally healthy. So where could a first responder start when they you know, have the, uh, the commitment, I want to start you know, creating this mental fitness plan, where would they start if they've never thought about doing it before? Um, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of self-help books out there, there's a lot of people, uh, I think uh, resources, increasing resources for people to start talking to. Um, I encourage uh, young officers uh, when they're first getting into the profession to, you know, you don't, you don't have to have a therapist forever, but, you know, seek someone out, learn about yourself, get curious about yourself, build a relationship with someone who knows your baseline when you're doing really well. Um, and, and develop, start to think about your plan, develop your own plan. Uh, and I, I think that's where I would recommend. I mean, f nowadays, if we want to improve our physical health, we all go hire a coach or personal trainer, right? Mm -hmm. But for some reason, we don't think, we only think that's what people who are sick do um, for mental health. And so I do, I really encourage people to begin to think about this stuff, learn about it. Some people are, are great at reading and learning on their own. Um, depends who their friends, their supports are, um, mm -hmm. using their own personal resources. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways to begin this process, but I think it's, the, it's taking that first step mm -hmm. forward. It sounds like it's a lot of independent work, so you don't necessarily have to go out and asking for help. You can start with reading a book, which is much more independent. And you know, if you want to keep it a little more anonymous, if you're not comfortable necessarily talking about it, potentially because of stigma. Yeah, you can start it on your own. A lot of services have peer support, so, uh, you know, there's resources. But again, they tend to be geared more towards, um, you know, helping people when they're in distress mm -hmm. and in crises, um, which is fine. Uh, but, but beginning to also, yeah, explore your community resources. Um, what are the things that bring you pleasure and meaning in life? Who are the source, Who are the people that you go to? And I think that's a really important uh, piece, especially when you're younger and beginning in this career.